Are you ready to see the albums that define some of the most important years in hip hop history? Because today, we're going to be looking at the best and worst rap album of every year from 2010 to 2020. Now, when it comes to the 2010s decade, there has been no period in rap music that has had more going on in the genre at once. From albums that became cultural staples to some of the most experimental and boundary pushing records ever released. These years were truly legendary for hip hop as we received some of the best albums of all time and while many see this era as a golden age where we just got nonstop classics, at the same time, we also ended up getting projects that set new standards on just how bad a rap album can be. From talentless pieces of trash who did everything for clout to horrific fall-offs, this period in hip-hop showed us that while rap music as an art form was reaching new heights, it was also hitting some staggering lows. So if you are ready to see the albums that defined hip-hop in this legendary era for better and for worse, let's waste no more time and let's get right into it. Now kicking off this list with the best album from 2010. In this spot, we got a pick that is about as undisputed as it can get with Kanye West's My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy and when it comes to Ye's legendary fifth studio album. What is there to even say about this project that hasn't been said already? No matter what you think of Kanye, you cannot deny that this album gets about as great as it gets as it doesn't just manage to embody all the quintessential aspects of a legendary era defining album, but it takes everything to levels that even after almost 15 years of being released, nobody has been able to even come close to. From the grandiose production to features so legendary that guests like Rick Ross had to make their own music videos for them. My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy is an album that isn't just the defining moment of Kanye West's career, but also for modern hip hop as well. Everything about this album just feels so much larger than life as Kanye took the concept of musical presentation and evolved it to make an experience that feels not just climactic and epic, but really life changing in its entirety. The songs on this album are so layered, complex, and dynamic as Kanye fine-tuned every single note to mere perfection and when you see how many hours he spent making some of these tracks, it really shows you that he was never more in tune with the full scope of his musical genius than here. The master's sampling, drum work, writing, use of features, and so much else all work in unison with one another to give us an experience that shows us rap music at its very best and while there is so much more to say about this record, I don't think you need me to tell you any more about why this album is great, so for all these reasons, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy is the best rap album from 2010 with ease. Now when it comes to the worst album of 2010, as one superstar released their magnum opus to kick off this decade, another legend dropped their absolute worst album with Lil Wayne and his venture into rock music Rebirth. Now when it comes to this album, before its release, Lil Wayne was in the very prime of his career as he was absolutely stealing the show on anything he was a part of and as he was on top of the rap world. He tried to prove that he was invincible as he ventured into rock music and while this goal was super ambitious, the end result was catastrophic. Now with Rebirth, outside of Drop the World with Eminem, which is a banger, Every song on this album fails miserably as Wayne meshes with the rock inspired production just about as well as Electric and Water do. Listening to this record from start to finish is an abysmal experience that feels so clunky, unrefined, and Lil Wayne raps over the beats on this project in a way that is so awful that it actually will end up giving you a headache. The rock inspired production trades in any semblance of quality that it could have to be about as loud and obnoxious as humanly possible and during a time where Lil Wayne dominated because of his one of a kind nuance and wit, he comes off sounding as uncharismatic as possible here which makes everything even more painful. This record really suffers because Lil Wayne's style and the soundscape just don't mesh one bit and instead of making competent music, it feels like they are fighting against one another at all times. So overall, while a Lil Wayne rock rap album could have worked if he actually attempted to adapt and evolve his style in a way that was genuinely meaningful, the half-baked product we ended up getting here has immortalized itself as the worst album of 2010. And now moving on to the best album of 2011. Despite this being a year that gave us such iconic albums as Jay-Z and Kanye's Watch the Throne, Drake's Take Care, or even Kendrick Lamar's Section 80, the best album from this year comes from The Roots with their record Undone and with some of the greatest storytelling ever portrayed on this album. This is a record that every rap fan should hear in their lifetime. Now when it comes to Undone, although this is The Roots' 12th studio album, 
While many musicians would be way beyond washed up at this point in their career, they really sound just about as hungry as ever as we hear the group evolve and modernize their sound for a new era all while retaining and really expanding on the aspects that made them so renowned throughout the 90s and the 2000s. When we look at the genius of this album, while the ethereal production spearheaded by the one and only Questlove makes it so entrancing sonically, what makes this record as amazing as it is, is the story that is carefully narrated throughout the entire project's 14 tracks. Now, the story that this album tells is about the life of a man named Redford Stevens, and what makes the narrative about his life so particularly interesting is that it is told in reverse, meaning that it begins with the tragic end to his life and spends every following moment exploring how he reached rock bottom. Now, through the delicate and poignant storytelling of group frontman Black Thought, and the additional performances from elite lyricists like Big Crit and Fonte. Each verse on this album is able to add more and more context to Stevens' life and truly immerse you within the scenarios and circumstances that drove him to try to save himself but sadly caused his demise. There are few albums ever that have been able to utilize the art of storytelling this powerfully, and beyond this, even fewer that use its sound design to not just complement the experience, but enhance the narrative in moments where words are not enough to describe the downfall of oneself, and for all of these reasons. Undone is the best rap album of 2011. Now back to the worst albums. Just as we looked at one of the most complex and intricately designed albums ever, we are now looking at one of the stupidest albums you will ever find with Gucci Mane and V Nasty's collab album Badal. And while Gucci Mane has released hundreds of projects in his career, this is without a doubt the most insufferable of them all as he teamed up with white girl mob member V Nasty and in a year where we saw maybe the most renowned hip hop duo team up for an album with Jay Z and Kanye. It's crazy because we also got a record from arguably the worst duo ever with this nightmare of a combo. Now in defense of Gucci Mane, he's really not that bad here as his performances are just about as standard as an early 2010s mixtape version of him got and while they are definitely not great or even slightly memorable. They are formidable, I guess, but when you look at the other half of the performances on this record from V Nasty, this project doesn't just disrespect everything that hip-hop stands for, but it's also one of the most confusing records ever released in the genre as well. This album really feels like a parody when you hear V Nasty come in and try to replicate exactly what Gucci Mane is doing in the most offensively horrible way possible, but it's not. This was an entire record that they actually thought was a good idea to release unironically, and it just makes no sense. Gucci Mane was really doing anything for the bag at this point because there is no other logical reason why he would have made an entire collab album with somebody who's about as entertaining to listen to as a wall. Now, if you don't understand how confusing of an album this is and how bad of a rapper that V Nasty was, Today, this would be like if NBA Youngboy made an entire collab album with Whoa Vicky, and if you can't imagine how horrible that would be, just listen to this because it's actually even worse than you would expect. So for being one of the biggest jokes of a record that hip hop has ever seen in its entire 50 year lineage, Badal is the worst project of 2011. Thankfully, back to the best albums on this list. For 2012, we have one of the greatest rap albums of all time with Kendrick Lamar's Good Kid Mad City and wow. To this day, even after over a decade of being out in the world, Good Kid Mad City is an experience that from its masterful storytelling to its decade-defining hits, offers up an experience that is so authentic to everything that hip-hop stands for that I'd go as far to call it the Illmatic of this generation. With Kendrick Lamar working on this album even before he released his debut project Section 80, this was the record that he always envisioned cementing his status as a great in the rap world, and that it did as the 12 tracks he poured his heart into made for one of the most immersive listening experiences in all of the genre. Good Kid Mad City is relatable yet unfamiliar, accessible yet complex, and it's this hard to come by blend of artistic ambiguity that has made this album infinitely replayable to this day. From start to finish, this album feels like a movie, with the vivid lyrical canvases being painted by Kendrick throwing you right within some of the craziest experiences he has ever lived through, and this 
along with the skits featuring his friends and family and even the one-of-a-kind beat switches, give this album such a distinct sense of style and tone that makes you invested in the world of it more than most other pieces of music or really media for that matter can ever make you. This is why a song like Sing About Me I'm Dying of Thirst is revered as one of the best in the genre's history because it is the very climax to everything we have learned about Kendrick on this album, and seeing him deconstruct his choices and examine his life in brutal honesty isn't just brilliant in and of itself but it also causes you, the listener, to look into your own soul as well. When an album is able to resonate with listeners so powerfully, it's truly a rare artistic achievement, and for Kendrick Lamar using his genius storytelling and songwriting skills, but most importantly, his emotional integrity to do this, Good Kid Mad City is without a doubt the best album from this year, and really one of the best ever. Now back to the bad side of this list, for the worst album of 2012, we got Ja Rule with P.I.L. 2, and with this record being a sequel to Ja Rule's triple platinum third studio album over a decade after its release, this was a desperate attempt for Ja to string on to any relevancy he had left, and after seeing what went down in his career after this, I think you can probably tell how this album went for him. This album just feels pathetic to listen to, as it's clear that from the very second you turn this thing on, you're listening to a rapper who deep down inside knows that his career is on life support and is just swinging at anything he can to retain any sort of relevance which clearly didn't work as the first week's sales for this thing were beyond terrible. Ja Rule's ashy voice feels so worn out on this album that it alone puts you to sleep and with the generic pop rap production and cheap attempts at trying to capitalize off of some of the most popular trends at the time. Looking back on this steaming pile of garbage all these years later, it only comes off as more rancid than it did back Back then. So for being one of the most pathetic rap albums of all time, Pain Is Love 2 is the worst album of 2012. Now when it comes to the best album for 2013, this was a pretty tough decision as it was a super competitive year for hip hop and while a lot of albums deserve honorable mentions. In this spot, I got Kanye West's 2013 album Yeezus which managed to get here by disregarding every single musical convention in rap music at the time. Now, where Kanye West had the best album of 2010 for making the ultimate hip-hop album, this album couldn't be more different as Yeezus is the antithesis to everything that hip-hop stood for at the time it was released. From start to finish on this album, everything about it is unconventional, and despite how hated this record was for this approach when it initially released, all these years later, many people have realized that the experimental approach Kanye took to this project ended up giving us an experience that is musically unlike anything else out there. The abrasive sound on Yeezus creates a sinister environment throughout the entire project that while showing us a version of Ye that was even more egotistical than he was on My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, uses this insane power trip that he goes on to speak out in some of the most important ways that he ever has in the second half of his career. Whether Ye's talking about the problems brought on by consumerism culture or he's alluding to how his fame is destroying him, beyond all of the spectacle of Yeezus, conceptually there is an album that is quite tragic. Now while this makes this album all the more layered thematically, at the end of the day, what makes this project as great as it is is the production job from Kanye which is arguably his best and that's really saying a lot. From the out of the box creativity to how dynamic and performative the instrumentals and arrangements became in themselves, with every beat switch, chord change, and contorted sample on this record, it only further showcased that Kanye West is truly one of the greatest musical innovators of all time. So for being an album that bent everything on its head and redefined the box that greatness could be judged in, Yeezus is the best album of 2013. Now when it comes to the worst album of 2013, we got another record that shows off a rapper who was trying to rejuvenate their fading career with LL Cool J's Authentic, and while don't get me wrong, LL Cool J's older albums still slap to this day, but it's clear that with this project, the modern LL Cool J has nothing left in the tank. Now with Authentic, from the cover alone which looks like it was done by somebody using Photoshop for the first time, we should have known that this record would be an absolute train wreck but beyond the horrible artwork. Somehow the music is even worse as we really see a once legendary rapper humiliate themselves with music that beyond being bad, is just straight out lame. Hello Cool J raps with about as much charisma as a robot here and even worse than his cringe inducing flow and nauseatingly bad punchlines. The beats on this project are genuinely some of the worst that were placed on a major rap album throughout this entire decade. This was because the instrumentals tried so hard to be modern and fresh, but they just didn't have an actual grasp on the pulse of what was going on in hip-hop around the time of its release, so while they tried so hard to evolve LL's sound, 
In actuality, they made him sound like an out-of-touch musical fossil, as the beats try so hard to fit in with the trends of the time that they end up making a rapper who was once at the cutting edge of what was buzzing in hip-hop look like an absolute shell of himself. Now, with this project running for over an hour through its 16 songs, all of this is made even more painful, so whatever you do, Please stay away from Authentic because this album will only take away a precious hour of your life and leave you with absolutely nothing in return. Now moving on to 2014, this was another special year for hip hop and while we got some iconic albums this year, taking the crown as the best we got Freddie Gibbs and Mad Lib's Pinata and when it comes to this combination of lyrical heavyweight Freddie Gibbs and one of the greatest producers of all time in Mad Lib. They delivered one of the greatest rapper-producer albums ever with this one. When we look at Pinata, while many of the best albums on this list arrive because of their one-of-a-kind creativity or generational storytelling, this is a record that dominated because it embodied hip-hop's most fundamental principles to mere perfection. With great bars and great beats, Freddie Gibbs and Mad Lib deliver 17 tracks of musical excellence filled with some of the most animated lyrical performances and best-sounding instrumental loops that you'll ever hear. From the moment you press play, Pinata redefines what the term peak hip hop means as Gibbs glides over Mad Lib's memorizing instrumentals in a manner like no other. This album sounds like a soundtrack to a classic crime drama with the suspense it's able to evoke between Gibbs' lyrics about his life on the streets and the jazz influenced soundscape that shows off the art of beat making at its finest. Now, while Freddie Gibbs may not have the respect he deserves from everybody in the culture, this album more than proves that he is one of the greatest MCs in modern hip hop as his larger than life career charisma, smooth flow, and technical proficiency make him one of the most unique and skilled personalities that all of hip-hop has to offer. Now beyond Gibbs' bars, this record gets even better as it is stacked with amazing features from the likes of Earl Sweatshirt, Mac Miller, Raekwon, Scarface, Absol, Danny Brown, and so many others. So overall, for being one of the best rapped and produced albums in all of modern hip-hop, Pinata is the best album of 2014. And coming in as the worst album of 2014, we got a record that showcases hip-hop at rock bottom with Nick Cannon's White People Party Music and oh my god. This record isn't just the worst album of 2014, but it's really one of the worst albums I have ever heard, as Nick Cannon manages to reach new lows even for himself here, with this being Cannon's first album since his debut in 2003. While for most artists who would have taken over a decade to release a new album, the long wait would have meant that they have spent years trying to make some of their best material. For somebody as talentless as Nick Cannon, Taking 10 years to release an album means that he had enough time to work on the most insufferable project out there, and oh my god, is this thing insufferable. Nick Cannon disgraces the microphone on this album like few other musical grifters ever have been able to, and as he creates songs centered around the most mind-numbing and superficial things possible, he truly pushes the boundaries forward for how bad music can be, and if it wasn't for the features from Future, Migos, and Pitbull who step in to save us from the full wrath of the obnoxiousness of Nick Cannon, this wouldn't just be one of the worst albums, but really one of the worst pieces of media that has ever been created by a human being. I can't even put into words how offensively bad this album is, so seriously, whatever you do, please do not find a way to ever allow your ears to touch this absolute piece of musical filth. Now, listening to this album honestly made me feel so bad that the only way I was able to even continue this list was by having an amazing meal from today's sponsor, Factor 75. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep, and unlike some of the trash artists on this list whose music makes you feel terrible. Factor's team of gourmet chefs create each meal using only ingredients with integrity to help you feel your best all day long. Now what makes Factor even better is that their meals are 100% ready to heat and eat so there's no prepping, cooking, or cleanup needed and no matter how much you want. Factor's got you covered as they are so flexible for your schedule that you can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 and 18 meals per week plus you can always pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time. Listening to so much horrible music to prepare for this list definitely took a toll on me, and after being tired out from a long day of hearing albums like this, 
Factor made my days so much better by being so easy and convenient to make as in just two minutes. I was able to prepare some amazing dishes. So head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code FANTASTICHH50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and free wellness shots for life. You can get two free wellness shots from three available flavors for every order while you are an active subscriber. And now, let's get back into the list. Now moving on to 2015's best album. We are looking at the holy grail of modern hip hop with Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly. Now when it comes to Kendrick Lamar's third studio album, this is one of the most important bodies of work that has ever been put into the hip hop world. From start to finish, this is a record that is truly flawless as every single aspect of it from its insane writing to its jazz infused production is actualized to mere and absolute perfection. Not just few rappers, but few artists ever operated on a level like Kendrick Lamar did on this album as every single performance he delivers showcased to us somebody who has absolutely mastered their craft. If you thought the storytelling on Good Kid Mad City was great, you're in for a treat with this album because Lamar took everything to an entirely new level as from the multi-layered meanings of each track to the poem that continues to unfold and reveal more as the album progresses. We witness a performance on Tepimba Butterfly that actualizes everything that hip hop can be. The emotion Kendrick pours into each song allows him to explore himself and society in ways that are more eye-opening than any other record in the genre and every song on this album highlights this in its own way as each moment off for something that is quite unlike the last. Whether Kendrick is rapping at the speed of light and talking about the damaging nature of society, or he's questioning all of his life choices in some of the most painstaking emotional reflections music has ever seen. Each song on To Pimp a Butterfly is so musically and narratively complex that you can sit there and study them for hours. So overall, even in a year as pivotal for hip hop as 2015, to Pimp a Butterfly is the best album from this year and really one of the best albums ever across all genres. Now looking at the worst album of 2015, we have one of the most catastrophic musical failures from a rapper ever with Kid Cudi's speeding bullet to heaven and just as I praise an experimental album when the artist's vision actually succeeds, I gotta be fair and criticize them when they fail and with Kid Cudi's fifth studio album, it really failed miserably. Now while speeding bullet to heaven is horrible, let me give it some credit. This album did come from a super genuine place and there definitely is a world where Cuddy's emotional vulnerability and memorizing vocals could have made for a legendary alternative rock album, but in actuality, the record we actually got just fell flat on its face as Cuddy's experimentation just went way too far without any rhyme or reason. From songs that are structurally all over the place to new vocal cadences that try to evoke untapped emotions but only end up causing headaches. Everything on Speeding Bullet to Heaven is so poorly done that it really just feels like all these songs were recorded during one single night from Cuddy and they were never pushed further beyond the demo stage. This is really the frustrating part about this album because there are small milliseconds where there is greatness fighting to come out but because of how unrefined it all is, any chance this record had of being decent is overtaken by all of its wasted potential. So while when you listen to this album, it seems like it was almost destined to become the worst of its year. Speeding Bullet to Heaven is a project that should have never gotten to this point and looking on it all these years later, this album should really be used as a warning to all artists and creatives to always challenge and flesh out their visions to the fullest extent because if Cuddy had given this record more time to really develop, it could have been one of his best albums but instead, it cemented as the very worst from 2015. Now when it comes to 2016. This was by far the toughest year to pick the best rap album as between Kanye West's The Life of Pablo and Danny Brown's Atrocity Exhibition. There was some all-time great competition, but ultimately, I went with the Tribe Called Quest's final album, We Got It From Here, Thank You For Your Service, which wow. In a year that's become infamous in hip hop culture for setting the stage for the next generation of rappers. A group from the 90s releasing the best album is absolutely insane, but when you look at this record and all it stands for, it's really not much of a surprise. Now with many reunion or comeback albums from legacy hip hop acts, so many legends fail at capturing greatness in their later years because they get so caught up in their own legacy and ethos that they forget to stop to look at what is still in front of them and this is exactly the trope that Tribe avoided to make this album so profound. 
As group leader Q-Tip kept his ear to what's new and continued to innovate his sound with time, and the lyrical conscience of the group Fife Dog continued to stay invested in what's going on in the rest of the world. Tribe was able to make a record that organically sounds so new and modern, with all of the songs on the record featuring verses that address relevant topics to the world and even use references that were so fresh and current. Because of this, the album doesn't feel like it's waving nostalgia in your face and instead, seems like a natural progression of everything that made Tribe so special in the first place. Hearing Q-Tip's one-of-a-kind ear take full advantage of the production and music-making techniques of today really feels like a cheat code because infusing Q's one-of-a-kind vision for arrangement and sampling with the tools that have revolutionized music making in this era ultimately creates a soundscape that makes this record feel like it's really from another dimension entirely. Adding to this modern feel, Tribe only features the most premier musical talent that hip-hop has had to offer since their initial run on this album, with guest appearances from Kendrick Lamar, Andre 3000, and Kanye West leading the list of generational artists who contributed to this vision so it can really be something that lives beyond the scope of the group and when we look at Kanye West specifically. A really interesting fact about this album is that Ye almost joined Tribe to help them finish this record when Fife Dog passed away, but as Fife already left the group with the performance of a lifetime, here. Kanye's services were not needed, and when we look at how great this album really is, understanding that the legendary Fife Dog put his last breathing words into making sure that this album managed to say everything that he ever wanted to, the entire experience becomes all the more powerful. So for all of these reasons, We Got It From Here, Thank You For Your Service is forever immortalized as the best album from this legendary year. And now looking at the worst album from 2016, the 2010s actually ended up housing an even more rancid collab record than Gucci Mane and V Nasties with Soulja Boy and Bow Wow's Ignorance Stuff. And if you thought any of the albums we looked at before this were bad, you better watch out because this record makes some of them look kinda good in comparison and I'm just gonna leave this here. I got nothing else to say about this musical piece of filth as it is so mind numbing that it actually begins to make you feel stupid and because of how repulsive Soulja Boy and Bow Wow are as a duo. If I had the choice to ban any artist from making music together, they would be at the very top of my list. So please, whatever you do, I urge you, do not check this record out. Now just like 2016, 2017 was a year that was really contended when it came to picking the best album and while Big Crits Forever is a mighty long time and Tyler the Creator's Flower Boy made strong cases for this spot and Kendrick Lamar almost earned his third album of the year with Dan. At the end of the day, I had to give it to Jay-Z's 444, which after decades of Jay being one of the most superficial and closed off individuals we have ever seen step behind the mic. This album redefined everything, not just for his career, but for his entire life. Now, in a genre where everything is so heavily based on the appearance you give off, the fact that the richest and most celebrated rapper in the world stood up and said that he is not the person we all think he is completely changed the status quo. Where Jay-Z albums before this were grandiose spectacles that portrayed him in a light that only made him seem more untouchable with each moment, 444 stripped away all the curtains and shut off the lights and optics to give us an intimate experience that didn't just destroy everything that Jay-Z's brand stood for but reinvented who Sean Carter the man was as a whole. Hearing Jay take accountability for all of his shortcomings as a man, father, and most crucially to the project, a husband, all over the minimally produced yet commanding instrumental loops from the one and only No ID. We are able to witness such an honest and human portrayal of the hip hop mogul and as Jay confides and confesses to all of his wrongdoings, it allows for us to see him for who he really is, a human being with flaws just like the rest of us. So overall, for Sean Carter putting Jay-Z's mask down and making an album that has now set the gold standard for how rappers should mature and evolve, 444 is the best album from 2017. Now just as Jay-Z set the gold standard for how a rapper should age with 444, none other than Eminem showed how a rapper shouldn't progress over time with the worst album of 2017 being his project Revival. Now with Revival, this is an album that humiliated a legendary rapper in ways that have never been seen before. From its overabundance of pop singers and songs designed for the radio to some of the worst lyrics ever written by a rapper who ever claimed to take the craft seriously. Revival was a complete musical betrayal to fans from Eminem. Where M was once witty, authentic, and boundary pushing in some shape or form, he was now dull and disingenuous as this album made for one of the most tone deaf records that rap has ever seen. Almost every song on this album misses in scorching fashion and the blandly offensive pop rap production isn't just hard in of itself. 
but M makes everything even worse as he delivers one of the most insufferable performances from not just a rap, but music icon ever. To this day, I don't think anyone knows what got in his head, but the rapper who was once praised for being so in touch with the people was so off the mark that even his most loyal fans turned their back and will never support him again because of this album. So all in all, for Revival virtually staining one of the most legendary rappers to ever live's entire career and just spitting in the face of his past work and hip-hop as a whole. Unfortunately, it's cemented as the worst album of 2017. Now moving on to 2018, this is a year that gave us a ton of great albums including Pusha T's Daytona, Travis Scott's Astroworld, Mac Miller's Swimming, Kids See Ghost, Denzel Curry's Taboo, and so much more but in this stacked year. The album that stands out as the very best to me is Earl Sweatshirt's Some Rap Songs which despite being so unconventional in its soundscape, runtime, and style, is truly one of the greatest achievements in all of modern rap music. Now with some rap songs, with this being the third studio album from Odd Future member Earl Sweatshirt, despite him shying away from the commercial success that he saw early into his career, this was an intentional artistic decision at this point, also he could make the music that he wanted to without any creative limitations and with this album. It is the pure embodiment of this. Now in a time in hip hop where so much was going on both for better and for worse. One of the most important trends that began to really emerge in the late 2010s centered around the rising vulnerability rappers were showing in their music and from exploring their personal battles to their own emotional state. Albums that tackled these previously shied away from topics broke down walls in hip hop and really pop culture as a whole as they helped push forward discussions around people's journeys towards self love and when it comes to records that embody this ever important moment. There is none that stand as a greater sentiment to the power of this trend more than some rap songs. In 15 tracks that only run for 25 minutes, Earl Sweatshirt put his entire heart and soul into a musical experience that navigates his journey towards self-healing and captures all of the emotions that he felt on the way. Whether he is bringing us down into the void that made for his lowest moments or we are witnessing him finally beginning to heal and love again, this album is one of the most emotional experiences you will ever face in all of media as Earl's writing only features the most profound and meaningful of lyrics and between these bars, his raw delivery and the production which mirrors his emotional state in its very nature at all times. Some Rap Songs is an album that will move you to tears just because of how vividly its emotions are able to capture you in. If you haven't listened to this album, I am gonna leave this here. I do not want to say anything more and ruin your first experience, but overall, for being a modern masterpiece, yes I said masterpiece, that beyond its technical excellence, is filled with themes and lyrics that will change anyone's life listening to it. Some Rap Songs is the best album of 2018. Now flipping the script, coming in as the worst from 2018, we got arguably the most hated rap album of all time with Lil Xan's Total Xanarchy. Now when it comes to this record, it is so bad that it isn't just despised by pretty much everybody, but it has been regarded by most hip hop fans as the worst album of all time and rightfully so. On this album, Lil Xan just takes the worst parts of the SoundCloud rap era and puts them all into one gross experience. Everything on this album is done in such poor taste, whether it's the glorification of substance abuse, Lil Xan's painfully uncharismatic presence, his flow which sounds like a 4th grader freestyling at a school lunch table, or the lifeless production which rides out the popular waves of the time. All of these aspects come together to make such a disgusting combination that on every single level, just fails miserably. So overall, for being a disgraceful project that embodies everything that has ever been wrong with hip-hop, music, and the entertainment industry as a whole, Total's Anarchy is the worst album of 2018. And now moving on to 2019, we have an album that isn't hip-hop in the traditional sense, but is still immortalized in the genre's recent history with Tyler the Creator's Igor and in an era currently where more rappers are stepping out of their comfort zone and the idea of hip hop as a whole is becoming less about a defined style and more about the spirit of what the artist is doing. It's more important than ever to recognize Tyler the Creator's fifth studio album in the grand lineage of the culture because it's responsible for so much in it. Now with Igor, Outside of a few sections where Tyler or some of the featured guests are rapping, this is a record that in every sense of the word, is unlike anything else you'll ever hear. There is no single genre that you can classify this thing by as this record takes elements from so much and infuses it all into a body of work that even after almost 5 years of being out, 
is still impossible to put into a box of any sort. Tyler truly made one of the most unique albums that any artist of his magnitude ever has, as between the dreamlike soundscape to the story told throughout the entire project about a love triangle that he is in the middle of. Igor evolves the aspects of what so many genres and most significantly hip-hop have been on the edge of pushing and because of the masterful way it was able to prove how limitless of a manner a rapper can create it. So many artists have just never looked back since its release and this has directly given us some of the most creative and innovative albums in all of rap music. Now, I've praised this album in other videos, so I don't want to waste any more time, but overall, while Igor is not a rap album in the traditional sense, as the 2010s decade concluded in hip-hop, Tyler the Creator's step into music that is really genreless represents just how far rap came in terms of how unpredictable it can be, and because of this, it stands tall as not just the most important album from this year, but also the best. Now, just as Tyler the Creator redefined the boundaries that hip-hop artists can find greatness through with Igor, at the same time, Logic set a new precedent for how horrible a music failure can get with the worst album of 2019, Supermarket, and oh my god. Even in a year where Chance the Rapper dropped a project as bad as The Big Day and Logic dropped another absolutely garbage album in Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, Supermarket somehow stands as the absolute worst of the worst. Serving as the musical score to a book that everybody's favorite biracial rapper wrote, Logic released this album out of nowhere and people just stomped this thing to the ground when they heard how bad it was. This album features 13 tracks of Logic trying to expand his musical borders and just failing in some of the most miserable and pathetic ways we have ever seen. Despite conceptually doing something creative by taking his hip-hop roots and infusing it with alternative indie and pop rock, there's just no creativity expressed whatsoever on this project. The production here is either nauseatingly dull or laughably bad, and whether Logic is singing or rapping, it's truly some of the cringiest material you will ever hear. So overall, for being an album so bad that it'll make you laugh and cry at the same time, Supermarket is the worst album of 2019. Now ending off this list, we are going to be looking at the year 2020, and while this year marked a new decade for hip-hop, it makes the title flow better and also gives us a look into where hip-hop was shifting at this point and in a year where really no major artists dropped because of world events. The throne in hip-hop was really open for the taking and while underground heavyweights and new innovators fought for this spot, ultimately coming in as the best album in this now underrated year. We got Westside Gun and his record Pray For Paris. Now with Pray For Paris, where the 2010s started off with Kanye releasing the ultimate hip-hop album, the 2020s kicked off with Griselda Records leader Westside Gun making the ultimate underground rap record. From the minimal instrumental loops to the long list of featured guests who spit some of their best verses ever on this project. Westside Gun designed this album to showcase what he and his Griselda Records imprint had been doing when it came to bringing lyrical rap and boom bap back into the center of hip hop and they definitely succeeded in doing this. From Griselda members like West himself, Benny the Butcher, and Conway the Machine to guests like Freddie Gibbs, Joey Badass, and Tyler the Creator. This album stands out because it is the ultimate lyrical sparring session between some of the most talented rappers ever and beyond the competition each lyricist has to stand out as the best. Making this record a truly great musical experience, the opulent production makes everything feel so grandiose and cinematic. So overall, for standing as an album that functions like a musical renaissance painting that shows the re-anointing of lyrical rap, Pray for Paris is the best album of 2020. And finally, as the worst album of 2020, we have 6 ix Project Tattletales, and after coming out of prison and being despised by the entire hip-hop community for being a rat, this was supposed to be 6 ix grand comeback album, but in actuality, it was even worse than all of his previous records, which really says a lot. Now, the reason why this album is so bad is because 6 9 pretty much doubled down on everything he was under scrutiny for at the time, and on top of all that, the only thing worse than the subject matter on this record was the way the actual song sounded. If you didn't like the way 6 ix 9 first sounded when he came onto the scene, you will hate this album even more because any small bits of quality that his music once had has all vanished away and as a result, you are just left listening to a screaming lunatic with a microphone. Now, I could go more into depth about why this record fails, but I'm gonna leave it here. This album is so creatively bankrupt that 6 9 had to recruit Lil Ak or Big Mac or DJ Academics, it doesn't even matter what his name is because if you need to to use academics in any capacity to rap on your album. It's clear that this thing is cooked. 
So for just innovating on how bad an album can really be, the atrocity that is Tattletales kicked off the 2020s decade as the worst album from it. So there you have it. There is my list of the best and worst albums of every year from 2010 to 2020. And let me know, do you want to see more of this? If you want to see me go back to the 2000s or even look into the 2020s, hit that subscribe button and leave a like. And just a reminder, if you want to take the hassle out of eating healthy, give Factor a try and head to factor75.com or click the link below and use my promo code FANTASTICHH50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. And if you want to see what rap labels are responsible for producing the highs and lows from this list, check out the suggested video.